welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. So today, Reed, we are going to wrap up this series that we've had the great blessing and privilege of listening to you know, from each of the different commanders. Lieutenant Colonel Fritz Gloyak, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Scheffler, Lieutenant Colonel Phil Ferris, Colonel Stuart Rubio, Colonel Mike Zulsdorf, each of these gentlemen, fantastic perspective, commentary that they provided. Huge thanks and round of applause to each of them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And two things. One, it's really good to be back. It's been too long uh, oh, yeah. since, since I've been on the podcast. Hello. <laughs> it's really good to be back. And two, I just want, for those who don't know, how miraculous it is that these incredible gentlemen gave us this amount of time. Yeah. If you know, then you know. You know how busy commanders are, and you will also be equally shocked. But if you don't, just it's hard to convey just how busy these folks are. You know, we had wing commanders on here, Colin. Wing commanders. I've been, you know, a direct subordinate of wing commanders, and I got less time as their subordinate (laughs) than they gave to our audience. So just feel the privilege that it is for someone of these positions to give us their time. We feel very grateful to have been able to bring that to you all. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a good place to start is to kind of paint that perspective of how busy these people truly are. I mean, we've talked about it before, but now having had their perspective and hearing them share some of their stories, I want to talk about kind of the contrary nature of being a commander and do this with the intent of showing, you know, how truly busy and involved these people are by virtue of their position. And what do I mean by contrary? Another term that could be used is dichotomy, where there are two competing aspects of a single issue, right? A great example of this that came up multiple times over the course of these interviews is mission and people. Yeah, that's the one I think we all, you know, from the very earliest days, it's presented to us. And then we all start thinking deep thoughts about it as second lieutenants, right? What is really meant by mission and people? Yeah, well. What's meant is this contrary nature of accomplishing the mission while also taking care of your people. Yeah. That the two are very much in competition. Exactly. And lest I, you know, anyone think I'm being facetious, you know, yes, you're thinking about this as a young CGO, but even these gentlemen, with some of them six commands, are still thinking and talking about this idea. Right. And I think that, Colin, you brought out that idea of these two competing interests that a commander has to balance. And there are others that you, you know, kind of came up with as you were listening to these interviews. Yeah, and I don't think that it's necessary for us to dive deep into each one of these things, but rather we share each of these different dichotomies, each of these different contrary things to share these different contraries with the invitation that you go back and listen to the episodes again and listen for where these things get highlighted, where they come up. So we already mentioned mission and people. Another one is the absolute authority that a commander has with the inability to carry it out, the inability to act. Yeah, that's one I hear pretty regularly. You know, these folks, some of them, this is the first time they've actually been judge and jury in the lives of their airmen, yet they can't get X done because they don't have any actual power to do it, you know, and these two competing things. Another one that command is filled with work that you can't and probably shouldn't be doing yourself, but this incredible amount of fun that you will have if you're doing it right. Yeah. So hard to describe. You know it when you see it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Again, if you know, you know, Yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Along with that is 
the frustrations that come with being a commander and coming up against bureaucracy and policy and all those things, kind of like what we were saying about authority and inability to act, but the joy that comes from mission accomplishment. Yeah. Seeing your folks succeed, you know, watching that one person really blossom that you've been, you know, trying to help get down the path towards their success. Yeah, that's a good one. Command is an assigned hardship, but it's also an earned privilege. You can feel from each of these gentlemen how difficult it is to be a commander, but how privileged they feel at their position. Yeah. And enough so that they signed back up. Some of them, <laughs> many of them were, right. were in their, you know, follow on command tours, which, yeah. yeah, is insane to me. And then last one, there are so many, but the infinite scope of command, but the finite time and resources and other limitations on your ability to be a commander. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. Super good. Um, I think each of those could get their own episode, but uh, where's the time? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Colin, after we talked about all those contraries, those dichotomies that you pointed out, it kind of made me think about the central themes that I pulled from each of them. I listened to each of these multiple times, got something out of all of them, but there were a couple themes that I felt repeated themselves a few times. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of those and kind of get your thoughts. The first one was how central to command establishing and communicating a vision, a direction was, right. and how many of them pointed out in all of the categories, whether it was improving the unit or managing resources, leading air, you name it, that failures centered in and around either forgetting the vision that they had established and, you know, getting sidelined, sidetracked by other things, or not establishing that vision sufficiently enough and communicating it sufficiently enough so that the people down the line could not or did not understand the vision. And along with that, and very much complementary, was the communication of intent. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes, you know, nicely with some of the things you just mentioned. If a commander is the only person actually doing the mission, things are super broken. Right. Right. Super broken. Yet they're responsible. And, and you know, that there's your contrary. But my point is, it's their job to establish the vision and communicate intent. That was something many of these folks brought up. And I, it came out multiple times and it really was like a central theme. What are some things you pulled out or other thoughts on what, you know, what I just mentioned? Well, 100%, I agree with you. That, that is exactly where my mind went as I was listening to these, as I was conducting the interviews and then listening to them again, that it's all about your ability as a commander to establish those priorities, that vision, that intent, and to communicate it clearly to every member of your command, squadron, group, wing. And then with that, providing the empowerment, the enabling influence the resources, guidance, the policy, whatever it is that your people need in order to achieve that intent. Yeah, because you can't do it and you better not. <laughs> <laughs> right. And as I was thinking about the overarching importance of those things, how important it is to practice that skill, because it, it is a skill. It's something that you can learn for sure. But Developing that skill for the first time when you become a commander is too late. That we need to begin much sooner in the development of an officer to prepare for command. And we already knew that, right? That's been something we talked about previously in this podcast. It's something that we trained our cadets to at OTS for you and ROTC for me. But I don't know that it really, I don't know that we're doing it as effectively as we can or emphasizing as much as we really need to. Yeah, well, and I totally agree. I had that same exact thought. I thought, wow, there's actually a method to the madness behind what we were training our students to do. It was to establish a vision and communicate intent. And then not do it yourself. And then not do it yourself, you know, but what we're kind of hinting at, Colin, is there's book knowledge, mm -hmm. and then there's 
like the ability to testify <laughs> because you <laughs> you now know it's been burned deep into you. Yeah. I am now pretty certain that I had book knowledge when I was an instructor about yeah. these things and I'm starting to gain that witness. And I think that's a perfect segue to kind of the last few items that really stood out to me is, you know, Colin, we've been doing this podcast now for, we're knocking the door at two and a half years, you know, headed well into three. And I feel like I'm learning still, but I'm also remembering stuff. I'm going to have to go back and listen to myself and remember things that I thought I knew and decided at some point in time. I already have done this recently. Someone asked me what my leadership philosophy was. And I'm like, well, I actually have a podcast episode I can go back to and remember yeah. what mattered to me then. And maybe do I need to update that? Have I gained some knowledge? Have I you know, had more insight? And what I'm getting at here is the requirement for successful command centered in and around the endless pursuit of getting better. Mm-hmm. of continuing to learn what it means to be a leader, what it means to be a commander, what it means to establish a vision and communicate intent, what it means to accomplish the mission and lead your airmen. You know, all of those things, like all of them, all of them mentioned this idea that they're still learning. I'm like, okay, wing commander with six commands, if you haven't figured this out by now, <laughs> but that's just it. That's the difference. Yeah. They are doing well because they have never given up the pursuit of learning. Exactly. And along with that comes the requirement of being in the chair. I think Colonel Zulsdorf, you know, said it best. He's like, you, you know, Reed and Colin, you guys, it, it was basically like, oh, bless your heart moment you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> from like a sweet Southern old lady, right? Who's like, oh, bless your heart. But he was like, but you just don't know. And he's right. That's why we had commanders on because mm-hmm. we recognize that we just don't know. And so, yeah, that idea of the constant pursuit of learning and getting better and the requirement of experience, that you cannot write this stuff down, you cannot prepare, there is no class you can take, despite what we just said, right, you need to practice now, you need to begin, you need to have that sight picture, that you're going for that, so that when it happens, you're a little bit more ready, but I don't think there is ever a, yay, verily, I've checked the box, I am ready for command. I just think there's got to be some seat time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Colonel Zulsdorf and I talked about it toward the end of our interview about you're comparing it to being a parent. We've said this before, that being an officer is very much like being a parent, that you can read all the books. You can even practice being a parent through babysitting, through watching your family kids, participating in boys and girls clubs, those kinds of things. You can practice it, but none of that compares to actually holding your own child in your arms and having to do it for real. Yeah, there's no time out. There's no give it back to the mom or dad. (laughs) <laughs> like that, that moment. And I can say being an FGO and in a leadership position, I've had that glimpse sometimes for the first time when someone brings something mm-hmm. to me and then I in turn tried to bring it to my commander. The commander kind of looked behind him and went, that's a you thing. <laughs> and I realized there, <laughs> there is nobody else. I got to deal yeah. with this thing that I'm holding now. And that's kind of a pucker factor moment, right? You know, you're just kind of like, wow, this this is getting pretty real. So I've started to get that glimpse. But the point is, yes, there are things you can do to prepare, but recognize that you are never going to be prepared. Just like you're never going to arrive as a leader, you have to be constantly learning. In the lead up to your command, you must be preparing, knowing that you will not be prepared. Yeah. Yeah. And Colin, I think that's a really good segue to the next thing you kind of want to talk about, something that Colonel Zulsdorf talked about, which is leaning into the gray. I loved this entire discussion. Right. I mean, it kind of does a disservice to talk about it here. Just go back and listen to it again. But it's so good. We can't just leave it there. We need to highlight how really useful this piece of knowledge is for us as officers, for us as future commanders, that... The Air Force gives us a huge amount of guidance, you know, written down policy, training through SOS, ACSC, the squadron commander's course, all of these things. You get lots of guidance that says in the black and the white, this is what thou shalt do, right? Yeah. But over the course of his six commands, 
he has learned and is inviting us to learn that the black and the white is insufficient and that you need to find the space between the black and the white and not just find it. You need to create space, find that gray area where you can find what he called maneuver, you know, that freedom of maneuver, your ability to be flexible and work out different options or solutions for the situation rather than being hindered by what's written down in the black and the white. Yeah. You know, you can think about this from so many ways. Think about if, you know, black and white photography or even like pencil drawing, if all you had Mm -hmm. was 100% black and 100% white, how rich, how meaningful, how illustrative would your photographs or your sketches be? How much more rich, how much more varied, how much more capable of communicating emotion and accomplishing their goal, right, of a photograph or a pencil drawing when you can shade, when you have that decision space. That's something that I use a lot when I'm trying to mentor folks, when they're asking what to do. I have found that one of the things commanders are most grumpy about is when you've made decisions that eliminates their decision space. And now the only option they have is one thing. They can no longer have multiple choices to find the ideal. And you see this most often when an airman breaks a rule and commanders are kind of bound. Yeah. They only have one option. They're grumpy about this. They like decision space. And so when someone comes to me like, hey, what should I do? Here's the situation. And I just say, well, which one gives your commander more decision space? Which one allows them more freedom of maneuver? Obviously, it has to be right. You know, we talked about this in the past, right? Repeatable, reputable, and transparent Yeah. when you're uncertain. But at the same point, like, you do have a lot of options very often. And you want to pass on as many of those options to your leadership as possible. But yeah, I absolutely love that entire discussion of leaning into the gray and finding it. And, you know, we talk about contraries, Colin. I mean, what else is war? if not an experience in contraries. You and I have deployed multiple times. The highest highs you've ever experienced, the lowest lows. You know, I remember a few times, you know, we're literally hunting human beings in the global war on terror. You know, it was very targeted. These were named objectives and wanting to hoop and holler when we actioned one of these high value targets. And then you realize that you're watching another human being bleed out. Yeah, And that contradiction of, I just did a thing really well, it was important, I've taken a life, and holding those two things in your hand, that's command. Holding the black, holding the white, and searching for the gray, like yeah. trying to find your way through. I mean, just in your description of it, you can see the, the contrary. You're talking about a human being, but you call them an objective. I did that psychologically on purpose on accident <laughs> all at the same time, right? Yeah. Like these are the ways we try as these fleshy meat bags that, you know, weak humans that we are, that we have to try to, to muddle through. Yeah, that's a good point. And because we're on the topic of war and this idea of maneuver, you know, bring it into the context of aviation, Boyd's energy maneuverability theory. You know, what makes an aircraft effective is the contrary of being able to gain and lose energy fast right? Mm -hmm. That's what makes the F-16, the F-15, the F-A-18, you know, and the fifth gen and sixth gen aircraft so incredible is their ability to navigate that dichotomy, right? Um, And that same principle has been carried over into the Marines and with their doctrine of maneuver warfare. They're giving themselves options. That's what this is all about is, you know, they're finding their right and their left bounds and trying to push those out as much as possible so that they can give themselves decision space, Mm -hmm. like you said, that they have this large area of gray wherein that they can maneuver and carry out those effects more effectively. Yeah, no, absolutely. And something too, I think is worth highlighting. Uh, So we're recording this on February 21st, 2022. Mm -hmm. Why? What's the so what of all of this? Yeah. You know, (laughs) what is the context of command? And it's the fight and win our nation's wars. And geopolitically, you know, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is certain at this point. Tensions are very high. War in Europe seems almost inevitable. 
And that's what this is about. Right. When you really have to get to brass tacks, why are we having this discussion? Yeah. For the feel good, when you warm fuzzy, this is what command is. No. Yeah. There's an actual reason for command. Yep. It's not for parades on the 4th of July or flyovers at your favorite sporting event. Although those things are great. And I truly wish that that's all we had to do. And everybody mm -hmm. else in the world would go, yeah, yeah, we'll just, we'll be good boys and girls and fall in line. That's not what it's about. It's about being entrusted with the lives of the men and women of this country to go and conduct violence on behalf of the nation in order to achieve our objectives. And yeah. the likelihood of that coming to the fore very quickly is very high. And, you know, here's the hoping that it won't result in broader conflict, but hope is not a plan. Uh, all my folks that I work with hear me say that all the time, but that is the context for all of this. That is the context. It's why we exist. Yeah. These commanders that we interviewed here, each of them grew up in the global war on terror, which is a great place for them to learn command. You know, there was a mission that they were tasked with carrying out, but that mission is very different and that command environment is very different from what we can expect to happen in a near peer competition where our ability to communicate is degraded, where the norm is not consolidated operations on a single location in a base, but dispersed across a large geographical area. In that type of situation, commanders are going to have to rely even more heavily on their ability to give a vision, to communicate intent, and empower their people to carry it out, knowing full well that there's a high likelihood that they're going to lose communications with those people, and they may even lose some of those people. Yeah. And I would even push that requirement down, which is the whole point of why we have this podcast, right? Is to try to help people grow and get better. Mm -hmm. Because just like I've experienced before, when I turn to my commander and look for help and he looks behind him and says, that's a you thing. Mm -hmm. When you are in the cockpit, when you are in, you know, your forward operating location and you don't have communication and you're that O3 who's in charge and some E7 comes to you with a problem and you look behind you, that E7 is going to go, sir or ma'am, that's a you thing, right? <laughs> that's a you it, thing. Yeah. That's a you thing. There's nobody else. You're carrying the baby now. Yeah. And we all have to get better. And that reality is very much staring us in the face right now. And, you know, not to get all dark and gloomy here, but um, this is why we do this. This is why we're here to get better mm -hmm. so that when that time comes and you try to look behind you, you at least have some inkling of an idea that, okay, now it's game time. Yeah. Thanks for taking us down that dark road, Reed. Yeah. Appreciate that. that. That's the job of the Intel guy, right? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sunshine over here. <laughs> well, I can't say that we're going to, you know, really pick things back up because we need to talk about what we didn't talk about in these interviews. We need to shine the light on the gaps that were present in this series and in our experience and this podcast really as a whole, right? So what am I talking about? We didn't get the full picture of command. No. Right? <laughs> no. We mentioned at the top of the episode that command is infinite in its scope. And there's no possible way that a commander can accomplish everything in the finite time and with the resources that they're given. Same is true for this podcast. It's finite. There's no possible way that we can get commentary and have a in-depth discussion about every aspect of command. For example, here are some things that we just didn't have the time to cover. We didn't get into G-series orders and non-judicial punishment, NJP. Didn't even touch it. Yeah, those are kind of a big deal. <laughs> we <Right>. didn't, even, <laughs> didn't even get there. Consumes a lot of their time. Yeah, we didn't even touch it. Yeah. Officer professional development. Commanders have the responsibility of developing their replacements, right? Yep. Yeah. The difference between home station command versus combat or deployed operations. You know, what is it like being over there in the fight? We didn't talk about the figurehead leadership, you know, that 4th of July parade that you're talking about. Yeah. We didn't even mention it. You know, yeah. commanders have the responsibility of being there, you know, shaking hands, kissing babies, giving out rewards, you know, giving all the kudos to the members of their command. 
we didn't even touch it. Yeah. I mean, if you think back to some of the leadership models we all learned in ROTC or OTS or at the academy, right? The inspirational motivation, right? That rah-rah aspect of a commander's job, it's constant. Yeah. And, and we didn't even, didn't even touch it. And probably even more important than that is not what we didn't cover, but who we didn't hear from. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at this list of commanders that we interviewed, fantastic humans, by the way, thank you to each of you gentlemen for giving us your time and sharing your expertise. But who didn't we interview because these were the people that we chose to interview? We only heard from 05s and 06s. Mm -hmm. We didn't hear from any 04s or 03s. You know, there are command opportunities given to majors and captains in some instances. Yeah, yeah. We also didn't hear from any general officers, 07 right. through 10. And those, we didn't even really talk about this idea of institutional leadership. Yeah. You know, most of these commanders, and the wing commanders are the exception here, because there's almost no way for them to know all their people. But most of them can get their arms around their thing whatever it is, right? They can generally get their arms around it, whether it's in a single physical location, whether it's, you know, a unifying mission, but they can kind of wrap their arms around it. How about MAGCOM commanders? <laughs> yeah, commander of PACOM. I don't know. It's just half the physical planet right. <laughs> and more than half the world's population. No big deal. You'll be fine, right? We, we didn't even talk about that, this idea yeah. of, you know, institutional command. Or command that spans not just a massive geographical area, but how about coalition command, you know, combatant command? You know, what is it like to command across not just geography, but culture, language barriers? I and mean, we've gotten into that before just in highlighting that it's a thing, but certainly none of these gentlemen, no offense to them, could provide that perspective. It's just, that's not in their lived experience. Yeah. Combat support agencies, you know, I'm thinking like the director of the NRO or the DIA or these other massive Department mm -hmm. of Defense organizations, they're commanders of, you know, untold tens of thousands. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Big organization. And we just, we didn't get there. We didn't get there. Who else? We mentioned that these are men. We did not hear from any women. They're white men. We didn't hear from anybody of color. We didn't hear from any blacks or Asians or Hispanics or you pick a minority. We didn't hear their perspective. And they're going to have a different lived experience, a different command experience than anybody else, right? Yeah. Yeah. And also even like general background of experience, we had combat support. Hey, Colin, what's your civil engineering? What's that? It's combat support. Yeah, and ops. Oh, that's me, right? These are the people that we have interacted with or that we have seen from our experience. We didn't have anybody from medical or, you know, some special duty like recruiting or instructing. There's so much experience that we didn't capture. And we own part of that, right? Yeah. We recognize that we have limitations, that we only have our network we can only, you know, go so far and, and find folks that we can connect to, but we recognize that that's a limitation that we have and that probably limited what we talked about. And again, this is not in any way to, you know, minimize the amazing contributions and the, the amazing learning points that we did get. And we're grateful for that. Just a recognition that it's incomplete. Yeah. And that's really all I wanted to say is that just like your preparation is going to be incomplete, just like your command experience is going to be incomplete, you bear a responsibility to try to fill that gap. And if there is a high note that we can end on with this episode, it's that. Our commitment to each other for our own development as officers in, in the Air Force, but also to the audience with the invitation to everybody else out there to find ways to fill that gap. If you know someone who is an 04, 03 in a command billet, go talk to them. What's their experience? If you happen to know a general officer, a major command, COCOM commander, go talk to them. Be like, hey, can you give me you know, five minutes of your time? <laughs> Which they probably don't have. But 
They'll have to ask their aide, who will then tell you that. <laughs> right. <laughs> their aide, who is an 06, right? Yeah. Can you distill down uh, for me, what is it like being a commander of tens of thousands of people leading across cultures and geography and all these things? If you know a female commander, a black or Asian or whatever commander, talk to them. What has been their experience? How did they get to command? What was it like commanding? If you are in ops, go talk to someone in combat support. If you're in combat support, go talk to someone in medical or acquisitions. Broaden your perspective. This is one of the ways that you are going to fill that gap and better prepare yourself for the time that will eventually come for so many to be a commander. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I think everybody who's listening is taking one step in that direction. And I want to thank mm -hmm. the audience for joining us today. You're here because you want to learn. And Colin and I are humbled and privileged that you feel that we have some things of value to put out there for you. We're so glad to be able to bring you these interviews with Colonel Rubio, Colonel Zulsdorf, Colonel Ferris, Scheffler, and Gloyek. Nice job. Yeah, we're all in this together. We're all learning. We're all trying to get better. And I think just by showing up, you're taking that first step on that path to define the gray, to lean into that unknown, and to close those gaps. Because that's what it's about. It's about trying to get better every day. Yeah. Awesome. That's a great place to leave it, don't you think? Yeah, the Intel guy brought some happiness. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. All right. And uh, let's ride that wave all the way out. All right. Again, thanks everybody for joining us. Anything else before we wrap up today, Colin? Just thanks to you, Reed, for having this conversation with me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's good to be back. That'll do it for this week's episode of Commission Ed.